Hi, and thanks for joining us today. Today I have Dr. Elizabeth Ann Danto. She is Professor Emeritus of Social Welfare at Hunter College, City University of New York. She received her PhD in clinical social work from New York University. Dr. Danto is the author of Freud's Free Clinics, Psychoanalysis and Social Justice, 1918 to 1938, which received both the Gradiva Award and the Goethe Prize. She is also the author of historical research and co-editor of Freud Tiffany, Anna Freud, Dorothy Tiffany, Burlingham, and the Best Possible School. Dr. Danto writes and lectures internationally on the history of psychoanalysis as a system of thought and a marker of urban culture. Dr. Danto, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, yeah, so it was uh, it was Dr. Lutnitz who mentioned your book to me, Freud's Free Clinics. Um, I recently read through that, found it very interesting. I never had never heard of that before. I would like to get into that in a little bit, but before we do so, can you just kind of tell me a, a little bit about yourself and what got you started uh, in social work and your interest in psychoanalysis and yeah. <laughs> well, I am what uh, one calls, we call, a child of the 60s. Oh. I had the great privilege of, of being in college um, at the time of the great marches in Washington and the women's marches in New York City. Mm. And um, I was sort of in the right place at the right time. I mean, not everybody agrees with me, but that's the way I think of it. Uh -huh. And uh, so... Um, I think it really imbued in me a sense that um, we are part of a larger world, part of a larger system, and it's incumbent on us to uh, change things for the better. Hmm. And um, so I went into social work, which was sort of a natural thing to do hmm. because it combined... Um, interpersonal work with political advocacy. Hmm. The two are um, co -e sort of co-equal branches in the field. And um, so I, I guess my second job in social work, I, I was very young, but was with at the Manhattan Family Court uh, with an agency called Court Appointed Special Advocates. And the advocates uh, were assigned to family court judges. Okay. So I had the great good luck of being assigned to the chambers of J Judge Nanette Dambitz, who was a, a brilliant judge um, from the family of uh, Judge Brandeis on the Supreme Court and she taught at Columbia. And so one day um, I was very puzzled by a case and she'd always said, oh, come in anytime, which of course was amazing for a judge to do. <laughs> and um, I asked her my questions and she took a book from her bookshelf and said, oh, here, these are the answers. And it was Anna Freud's uh, Beyond the Best Interest of the Child. Huh. And that absolutely opened up a universe for me. The huh. idea of children's rights was totally the missing gap. Hmm. And um, so actually I got to Sigmund Freud through Anna Freud. Okay. Um, so I um, kept doing social work in uh, various capacities and a lot of my inspiration came from Dr. David Smith, the founder of the Haight-Ashbury Medical Clinic in San Francisco, which oh. was, of course, of my era, 1968, 1970, and the non-judgmental delivery of medical services to drug users, people with mental health challenges. Hmm. Um, so anyway, at a certain point, you know, I... Um, I did to get, you know, I'd been in the field for a long time, like 20 years. I decided to get my PhD. And um, 
Oh, well, in the meantime, I was reading, I was reading and I was reading Freud. Okay. So I was reading Freud and I had this basic problem, which is Freud then had the reputation of being anti-feminist and bourgeois and repressive, blah, 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 blah. And I wasn't seeing that. Hmm. And I saw it as, wow, he's figured out a model of the mind. He asks the most incredible questions. I mean, he, you know, the famous question, what do women want? It's like, he asked. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I had a very different take, and I didn't know what was going on. So anyway, um, so I started the PhD program at NYU, and that, George Frank, who was the director of it at Orientation, said, you know, well, in the next uh, seven weeks, you're going to read all of Freud's major papers. Oh, wow. I thought, all right, great. But unfortunately, I have pretty much done that. <laughs> so I decided to um, contextualize, you know, to read history. So I read uh, Peter Gay's monumental biography of Freud. Oh. And there was this footnote that talked about this free clinic. And, oh. know, and I said, oh, that sounds like David Smith's clinic. And then I read a biography of Anna Freud, Elizabeth Young Brule's biography of Anna Freud. And uh, she said similar things and also mentioned Anna Freud's friendship and uh, work with with the socialists, with Berenfeld and with Eichhorn. And so um, I just sort of this light bulb went off mm. and I said, I'm going to connect the dots. Mm. And so I started doing this historical investigation and um, at NYU, I was taking a course in public history and there were some, just still some people alive whom I could interview because it oh. wasn't in the books. And um, yeah, so that got me going. <laughs> and um, it opened up um, an in incredibly rich data sources. Uh, it's not that the data wasn't there, it's that nobody had collected it. Mm. So I was lucky and um, I was able to develop a, a new hypothesis for Freudian psych for the method for both the theory and the therapy as a theory of emancipation and um and I'm just still doing it. It's amazing how much <laughs> there is that has not been um, you know hasn't been um entered into the everyday vocabulary, although the narrative really is changing now. I mean oh. really oh, good done my job <laughs> <laughs> good good what do you mean you're still doing it what what are you <laughs> um well i'm back to anna freud oh. um so uh i um i knew from some of her correspondence that she part of her um um ideas about psychoanalytic pedagogy mm. were not confined to the Vienna clinic, but in fact started she had started moving out into the community and delivering a lot of lectures. Okay. And so the more I investigated that, the more I was able to locate these community-based clinics in schools and in housing developments in Vienna of the 1920s and 30s, hmm. early 30s, obviously. And um, then I started reading um, this journal that she developed, I mean, co-developed with Eichhorn and Heinrich Meng and um, 
called the Journal of Psychoanalytic Pedagogy, and it's basically um, case material and theory from these clinics. And so there's this whole area that started actually in the late, around 1926-27, which um, was the antecedent for what we now call community psychoanalysis. Oh. And so um, today, certainly in, in all parts of the, at least in the U.S., and Deborah Lupnitz is one of the pioneers of this, of course, hmm. um, of community psychoanalysis. So now I'm sort of back to Anna Freud. I'm um, doing a um, a an edited collection of her work um, huh. for uh, which has never been translated into Portuguese. So it's for oh, wow. it's for my. Uh, publisher in brazil and oh. so it's a very exciting yeah. yeah yeah wow that's that's really neat that's um i'm actually reading through peter gay's autobiography of freud right now or biography of freud. Have, oh yeah. yeah it's great yeah uh, i haven't gotten to that footnote yet but that's that's <laughs> that's so cool how um i don't know it's just it's i feel like you in a lot of ways it took you to write the book that you wrote, like no one else, you know, and I feel like the way that you saw things at the time was different than a lot of maybe Pete, like you said, the narrative then was Freud was uh, like sexist, anti, what all these things. And you were like, well, that's not what I'm seeing. And, yeah. and then you saw these footnotes, you started putting things together. And then that's, that's pretty amazing. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can, can, while we're on that topic, can you just for the my listeners who haven't heard of Freud's Free Clinic, can you kind of um, outline the book a little bit for us? Oh, sure. My pleasure. Well, the subtitle of the book is uh, Psychoanalysis and Social Justice, 1918-1938. Hmm. Uh, so the book is um, 20 chapters, uh, one per year. Oh. Um, and it's... Uh, uh the it's all based on frankly my own research into primary uh sources scouring primary sources everywhere from um i mean for new york the library of congress um uh the london um the british psychoanalytic society um Germany and uh, Koblenz, a lot of research in Vienna in Austria, and mm. fortunately also a lot of oral history interviews oh. um, on uh, what actually happened. My first interview was um, was with Elsa Pappenheim, who, who escaped. Many of them were Jewish, and many oh. of them had to escape. And I said, what is this that I hear about free clinics? I mean, I knew they existed. <laughs> and she said, I mean, she was born in Austria and, um, you know, had gone to medical school there before she had to leave. And she said, well, of course. She said, all the doctors, all, all the medical professions had clinics, so why shouldn't the psychoanalysts have one too? <laughs> and um, so it sort of it just uh, built and built and built. Uh, and then because I'm a social worker, um, so I I'm not a historian and I'm not a psychoanalyst, I'm, right? Uh, so again, the the sort of uh, core of social work is person and environment. Uh, so um so it's not only that the clinics existed but what was the overall overall environment what was the uh politics of the era what made it possible what made it difficult uh. so forth and that's what when i started to find the history of interwar vienna 
uh, which with the collapse of empire, saw the social democrats win the first free elections, mm -hmm. in the first elections period in Austria. Um, and so that led to this huge upsurge of uh, cultural and intellectual production and amazing advances in medicine, mm -hmm. um, of which psychoanalysis was part. Um, so what's interesting is that it, in many ways, it parallels the history of Weimar Germany of the same era, but uh, it because Austria is so small and I, I don't know, for many different reasons, it had really basically been ignored. Mm -hmm. um, there were very few books about it. So again, I had to do a, a lot of investigation. Uh -huh. Again, that led me back to Austria. Um, um, yeah, after I left the university, I ended up moving there for seven years. Oh, wow. To New York two years ago. Oh. Um, and um, yeah, because, you know, and also looking at the, like the relationship between London and Berlin and Barbara Lowe had gone from one who was a British psychoanalyst from London to visit the analysts at the Institute in Berlin and took the news back and said, we should really have a free clinic. Mm -hmm. And so it grew in that way, but it was very, also very much linked to uh, what was possible socially and politically. Uh -huh. um, and then I started finding out that the some of the Viennese analysts were in fact so politically involved that they were members of the city council uh -huh. and that in turn influenced the acceptance of the clinics. And then I started looking through newspapers because in public history, that's what you do. Uh -huh. And um, I found that psychoanalysis was widely accepted in the everyday urban press. And there were loads of articles about it and so forth. And then later, as I started m moving further back into the work of Anna Freud, I found the announcements of all of her clinics in various oh. parts of Vienna and so forth. Wow. How many years did that take you? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I I guess I um I I I wrote a sketch of this uh, -huh. uh for my dissertation, which was years ago in nineteen ninety six. That's when I got my doctorate. Uh -huh. And then um, I started going deeper into a couple of the clinics and publishing the articles. And I guess the book came out in in '05. Hmm. So it took me a while. You know, I was working full time. I was a professor, so oh, okay. You no, know, um, yeah, very a very full time because you know, the city university, it's the public university, people are very engaged. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Is, uh, other than, so your initial kind of mind blown moment was, wow, there were free clinics, like I need to look into this. Once you started looking into it and you're able to interview people like that, uh, mm -hmm. was there anything that popped out? What was like, what's, what popped out to you more? Uh, like again, that was like, wow, how did how did we not know this or any any yeah, that's a good question because people to whom I spoke about this, and you know, it's all data driven. I mean, huh. the research is there. Yeah. So you can quarrel with my interpretation, but not my research. Yeah. If you want to quarrel with the research, you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, you know. And, um, but the question was always just that, how, why did we never know about this? Hmm. Why, um, why had this sort of, um, false narrative been able to, de de um, 
take hold. Yeah. So um, there are a couple of reasons, and I, I wrote I wrote another paper about this, but um, because of the uh, Nazi Anschluss, the joining in mm. uh, in thirty eight, as you know, the the um, you know, being Jewish was essentially a death sentence. And um, most of the psychoanalysts were Jewish. And um, so uh, they had to flee. Um, but they weren't so welcome. <laughs> huh. Right? Um, yeah. And not only, some went, were able to get to the UK, but in the US... Um, the notorious quote, land of the free, uh, we had um, uh, J. Edgar Hoover as gatekeeper. Huh. So this was, to, you know, as McCarthyism was already growing and, and J. Edgar Hoover was there and he was the epitome of um, what today we call Christian nationalism and um, he hated, he heard about the psychoanalysts and uh, labeled them communist, queer, and mentally twisted. <laughs> wow. And so there's this whole history of um, of Hoover's persecution, surveillance and persecution of the analysts who indeed did have these left-wing backgrounds, hmm. did not were, did not object to homosexuality, hmm. were Jewish and also largely atheist. <laughs> um, I mean, everything that Hoover absolutely loathed. Yeah. And, you know, he was on this moral crusade and, um, and he essentially uh, terrorized the community. Uh, hmm. And so all of that went underground. There were things they could not talk about. If they had to survive, they couldn't talk about it. Uh -huh. They did, many of the analysts, when they they did find <laughs> uh, jobs largely in the social service communities. So the social work agencies, um, like, um, oh, in... So really all over the country actually yeah. housed them. And then they set up their own uh, institutes and so forth. So okay. by at a certain point, um, you know, there was this huge question about whether they were medical or not. They weren't really. But anyway, so yeah, so the history was repressed they repress it to save their skins, basically. Hmm. Okay, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, if I can comment on a few things. Uh, one, you talked about, you started looking into, okay, as a social worker, uh, it's about environment, like the political landscape and person. And it makes a lot more sense to know like how you said I think her name was Oppenheimer that you that you interviewed and she said well Oppenheim she Oppenheim. said well yeah the the doctors they all had free clinics why would the psychoanalysts not have them too and there's a there's a quote that you it's, it's a speech that Freud was giving uh in I think 1918 like, right. the, and he said uh the poor man should have just as much right to assistance for his mind as he now has to the life-saving help offered by surgery. And I was like, well, that, I mean, that makes sense. Like, especially if, if Freud, you know, psychoanalysis was a science and you had people who, if you think of Freud's to love and to work, yeah. and you have people who are unable to work because of their uh, mental functioning, then why would society not invest and in, their health care just as much as they would someone who's not able to work because of a broken limb or something. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so part of that is the um is the is the belief in social democracy. I mean he was a social democrat. Hmm. And 
you know, Vienna had been devastated by the war. And so to rebuild the city and actually the nation, you had to have a healthy population. Hmm. Um, and so a lot of what we have today actually comes from that era. One of my favorite stories is tuberculosis was so rampant and killed hundreds of thousands of children so big, it was actually called the Fiona disease. Huh. The response was to develop mechanized garbage collection, right? So the mechanized garbage trucks would clean the streets and cleaning the streets has, you know, saved hundreds of thousands of lives. So now whenever you look at, for, at a garbage truck or a sanitation truck, you can think, ah, <laughs> Vienna, 1927. <laughs> Actually, earlier, probably 23. But there you uh, go. Uh, wow. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and th yeah, the second thing is I I am so you said the narrative is shifting, and I, that's good. I I I read a quote by Theodore Reich where he was basically talking about how even in his day, um, the the Freud that people talked about was a completely different Freud than the Freud that he personally knew. And, exactly. um, and I feel like I was even in like, I went through undergrad in psychology, graduate school in psychology, and nobody really talks about Freud. If they do, they talk about how he used cocaine and he was a, a sexist and penis envy, you know, those are like right. the three things you learn. Um, sure. so, I, I've been on this journey and uh, so I, like reading your book was really helpful. I, I didn't know that Freud would have been a social Democrat and uh, just different things like the way that the way that like that quote, the way that he speaks and the things that you quote him saying in the book is like, wow, this is a yeah, this is a different Freud than the Freud that I've heard about, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I was um, I taught. Um, uh, yes, you know, at a hunter for many years, and <clears throat> so look as an introduction. Hi, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, as an introduction, I would always say to the students, um, "Okay, so what have you heard about Sigmund Freud?" Huh. <clears throat> and they say, "Oh, well, he was a sexist, or he was a big cokehead, or." <laughs> And then I'd say, yeah, well, how many cocaine users do you know who discovered psychoanalysis? <laughs> and, um, and then a lot of what they had heard was simply false. Mm. Like, well, he was a Victorian. Um, and then you say, well, when was the Victorian era? Right? Okay. Yeah. Late uh, 1904, things like, when was Freud writing? All right early 20th century, especially in the 1920s. 20th century is modernism. It's not Victorian. Uh -huh. And and so just a few simple, like, reconstruct, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, Freud was a modernist. He was, and, and it's the dating. I mean, you just have the dates there. Uh -huh. That really helps. So, and it, but it's fascinating how, like, he, he, there was, yeah, he wore traditional suits. He had a big family. He was a doctor. There's no question. But um, just because you wear a suit doesn't make you a Victorian. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I, I, I think it's pretty neat how, yeah, you have the data and you just lay it out there. And a lot of times that's, yeah, like in that case, that's all it takes is, and then people start like, what do I, what do I know? What do I, <laughs> yeah. Um, so great. So yeah, what, what have you, what has life been like since the book? What have you been working on? You said you're working on a new book. Can you tell us a little bit? Yeah. Well, since the book, well, um, you know, I did a lot of teaching. Hmm. I'm a lot of uh, lecturing. Um, all over the U.S. and in Europe. Oh. Um, I did a, a textbook on um, historical research oh. um, for uh, for a series of research 
uh, textbooks. Um, then I, um, let me see, um, in about around 2013, 14, maybe 12, I don't know. At any rate, through a series of coincidences, I met um, the grandson of Dorothy Tiffany Burlingham. So uh, she was the youngest daughter of Lewis Comfort Tiffany, the great American artist. Oh. She moved herself and her four children to Vienna um, to escape a very bad mar marriage and also the demands and pressures of um, life in New York and so oh. forth. Yeah. So she met, she and Anna Freud met and they became life partners. Uh -huh. So this is not very well known, but I find it very interesting that the youngest daughter, the, so you have these two youngest daughters of great men, right? Uh -huh. you have Anna, the youngest daughter of Sigmund Freud, and Dorothy, the youngest daughter of Louis Comfort Tiffany. Uh -huh. um, and um, again, through a series of coincidences, I met um, Dorothy's grandson, and was given access to um, some family photographs, including photographs of this school that it was a fascinating experiment. It was probably the first experiment in psychoanalytically informed education. And um, uh, so uh, I had these photographs and I had already been interested in this school named called the Heatsing School. And one way or another, at any rate, I met the um uh I proposed the idea of exhibiting them to the Freud Museum London, um, got some grants together, and in the summer of 17 we mounted this exhibit as uh, major summer exhibit so it was and did a, a conference around the teaching school from major scholars and then um i also uh made a film about anna Freud. Oh. so we had the uh, book that came out from routledge that's the Troy tiffany book and then uh the film which was has been has traveled all the way around the world. Wow. So, um, is the yeah. film by the same name? Uh, the film is called Anna Freud and the Conscience of Society. Okay. It's on YouTube. You can find it. Oh, okay. If not, I can send you the link. Yeah, yeah. And I'll link it in this video. Right. Yeah. So, that film uh, has been, it's a 15 and a half minute short film. It's been translated into uh, German, um, Portuguese, Italian, and it's pretty much used for training purposes worldwide now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Neat. And then, yeah, so, and then I guess in the last five years, I've been um, doing a lot of work in um, Brazil. Brazil has this incredible network of community mental health, and it's all, all I don't know, thousand clinics are all psychoanalytically informed. And oh. um, uh, yeah, so I was there actually in September. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That sounds like a. Uh great lifetime of work and achievements yeah <laughs> and it sounds like to me it sounds like a lot of fun all along the way has it did you have fun with with this research with the books like is it fun for you absolutely yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. it feels um uh, 
it's just a funny thing. It was when I figured out this piece of the puzzle, this, you know, this quit, this thing that had been misunderstood that I had to redress. It just made so much sense to me. And I, I don't know. I just knew I was right. Does that sound, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. and Ever since then, to have people say to me, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's pretty darn rewarding. You know? Yeah, yeah, really and is. People say to me, how can you write about Sigmund Freud? <laughs> like, well, because there was a mistake made, you know? Uh, if there had been a mathematical error, people would have wanted to correct the error. There was uh, a mistake, you know? It's, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. Very neat. Is that uh is that what got you invited to lecture internationally and stuff like that? Oh sure, yeah. yeah. Uh. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh uh, again, all over US, Europe, Latin America, mm. um not Asia or Southeast Asia, but uh. yeah, I I still travel a lot. Good. Yeah. Good. So fun. It is, yeah, it is. And I have I have, you know, four languages, so oh. I can lecture in a variety of languages. Oh. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> but um, I also consider myself lucky, you know, that I that I uh, I figured this out. You know? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a mixture of of stumbling upon something for the first time um but also like your unique interests and makeup and the things that you had read and the hard work but also like yeah a lot of things just came together mm -hmm. yeah. exactly right i know i i think a couple questions um maybe i'll go backwards first and then we can go forward sure. so what is it that uh where this when you were coming up through the rank when you were first beginning in social work yeah. um was the was there an interest in psychoanalysis at the time or if not what is it about you why were you interested in what got you interested in psychoanalysis um i'm I think um, uh, psychoanalysis was, yeah, it was accepted. It was uh, not disparaged, mm. um, especially ego psychology. Huh. Um, yeah, um, I got my master's at Columbia and um, it uh yeah a lot of um a lot of my peers were interested in doing um political work becoming psychotherapists um a lot of interest in um working with children mm. um uh, yeah i it wasn't um Oh, yeah, there was a lot of Freud, uh, some Erickson, mm. um, but it was the pretty much the standard model of human behavior. Uh, oh. um, yeah. Okay. Um, but again, you know, there was always this conflict in social work and I personally, I think it's an artificial conflict huh. between the uh, clinicians and the community organizers, oh. right? Yeah. Whereas, in fact, what for me, what defines social work is the merger of the two. Mm. So, mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but there also was a. Uh, I mean, especially among the more politically involved, the more community 
organizer there was um, some hostility to psychoanalysis. The problem that a lot of people who were hostile to it encountered was that psychoanalysis had the most humanist approach. Uh. Because otherwise you got like behavioral therapy or cognitive therapies, all of which are involved in the con- the prediction and control of human behavior. Uh-huh. Where in a, when you're a social worker, you don't want to control human behavior. Mm. You want to understand it. Mm. So to understand it and help people understand their behavior, right? Yeah. The, the default methodology is psychoanalytic. Oh, I see. Right? Yeah. Had you guys, did you, was Alfred Adler ever talked about? Um, to, to some extent, oh. um, you know, there's a big Adler Institute and facility here. Um, okay. Um, he's really, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I did some investigations of Adler, and he's really not that different from Freud, actually. Oh. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, again, there are various narratives that surround him. The other thing is that um, the um, he has this idea of uh, Gemeindegefühl, which is um, community feeling, and and that like if the child doesn't join the school community, then he or she is sort of defective in some way. So it has been argued that Adler's method can be um, sort of punitive. Mm. Um, especially when applied to groups. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, he's just, he's not as, um, a, a bigger name, but he was certainly, he wrote some interesting things. And I mean, he certainly did also have his own network of, uh, free clinics and, uh, nursery schools. So he was a hardworking guy, but yeah. his um this idea of Gemeindegefühl is pretty controversial. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that he was involved in like uh, going to schools and um, teaching teachers how to help the children. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I just yeah. I, that sounded kind of more social work ish. To me, yeah. so I'd, <laughs> yeah, but they were all interested in they all uh, sort of uh, teaching the teacher, training the teacher. Oh. There was a lot of teacher training. Okay. And, um, and Freud did the same thing, she, and then she wrote this book oh. called Four Lectures for Teachers and Parents. Oh. Um, that was published between twenty seven and twenty nine. So I mean the um. Pedagogy was one of the signature movements of Red Vienna. Mm. Um, and it was the education, early childhood education was the largest line item in the city council budget in, um, in uh, Vienna. I mean, and everybody was involved in teaching in schools. I mean, even Ludwig Wittgenstein, you know, the, the philosopher. Yeah was an early childhood educator. I mean, oh. it was just, it was like, I don't know. It was as if today, you know, people want to go into the movies. I, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, but it was really pretty much the dominant, in, um, the, the dominant movement. Hmm. It was not at all. It was not um, as gendered as it is today. Hmm. Um, I mean, to some extent, but not, uh, not quite not what is it today um the the development of schools was enormous um and then there were health and mental health clinics within the schools um and a lot yeah a lot i mean yeah pretty neat yeah yeah i mean it was probably red vienna was probably 
you know, the greatest experiment in urban socialism the West has known, mm. really. You know. mm. And not much is, I mean, a little bit people are starting to write about it. There's this one book by this guy, Helmut Grobar. He was the first one, and it's got a lot of information, but it's also... Um, um, politically, you know, he, he think conceives of it as counter revolutionary. Oh. So he he you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, Trotsky was there. All all these people were there, but he he thinks of it as counter revolutionary. Whereas I think, hey, you build housing, that's great. Build more. <laughs> There's nothing counter revolutionary, <laughs> but you know, yeah. um, uh, dedicated um, core Leninists um, or Trotskyists would might think so. Yeah. Uh, what do you um, What do you have planned for the future? What do you Do you have anything that you're going to be working on, or? Well, as I said, I just um, just started. I. I finished a project in <laughs> in Sao Paulo, uh, a teacher training project, actually. Huh. I mean, psychoanalysts and and teachers, um, and the project was a series of lectures and a series of seminars in Sao Paulo with community analysts, huh. actually analysts from all over Brazil came, which was very nice. Wow. And it was, um, Anna Freud has this essay called The Ideal Psychological Clinic. So it was over four days to conceptualize and visualize the ideal psychoanalytic clinic. Anyway, so, um, so that's finished, although um, a colleague and I are writing about it. And then... Um, and then putting together and then putting together this new collection of uh, obviously annotated and with a lot of research of my own mm -hmm. Anna Freud's writings for um a new audience in Brazil. Uh -huh. What is it uh is 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 it the environment or the culture of Brazil that makes Brazil, uh, I, th I don't know, appealing is not the right word, but you're doing a lot of work in Brazil. Is that? You know, I've wondered that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, um, my, they, my book was translated um, a number of years ago. Oh. Well, I don't know, maybe, let me, uh, in 19, 2019, it was before the pandemic. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it's been, it's done very well. Um, um, people like my work. But, you know, the Brazilian culture is very community-based. Mm -hmm. It's not like American individualism. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, as I said, thousands of clinics in Brazil. I mean, every, every community, every agency, I mean, you can go to a what we would call a multi-service agency here and and they have, you know, child care and yoga classes and mm. basket weaving and um, your free psychoanalytic clinic. Mm. I mean, all, really, all wow. over. Yeah. It's, I couldn't <laughs> it when I went there. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and then you, you've heard, I'm sure, of the favelas. Mm. Right, the quote slums, which are not at all. It's just the real estate developers um, call them that because they can't get in. Um, 
you know, all have, I mean, in Sao Paulo, I was at this, I was teaching at this community center that's called the Favela School of Psychoanalysis, you know. It's, oh. um, so I don't know. It's like they like me, I like them. We think yeah. the same. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a very big country, and it, that, you know, the national values are, hmm. uh, we say the same kind of values. You know, and it's interesting, right? Yeah. So yeah. interesting. So fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I agree. It's just, it's it's um it's wild to see the type of like the 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 path. Like you would never you would have never dreamed of that. Oh, if I write this book one day, I'll be lecturing in Brazil, and I'll really love it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You know, part of it is. I mean, I didn't. <laughs> I never even thought I would be joining academia, you know. It, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. it sort of found me. I didn't like, okay, that looks like a good thing to do. Hmm. And yeah. Looking uh looking back on your career, uh is there anything like I don't know, not not that you would have done different, but is there uh Maybe like, what are you, what are you most thankful for or what, what stands out to you the most? Um, oh, what stands, you mean formatively? Um, yeah, let's go, let's go there. Yeah, well, as I started, I think, um, being, an undergraduate when I was an undergraduate and uh -huh. um, I'm in a really deep way believing that change is possible mm. but that you have to make change happen mm. and I'm as you probably noticed you know a very autonomous kind of strong-headed person <laughs> and um, I mean I'm very very hard working too but yes. you know but but that's part of it. But I think, um, yeah, you know, some of those speeches, and then, and then, the Kennedy assassinations, mm. and and then um, some of the, and then the women's movement, the Great Women's March in New York in nineteen seventy one, just kind of you know, blew the lid off of the Midwestern conservatism into which I was born. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, formatively and and then, and then the aspects of repression also of the 1960s, the, you know, the police on horseback and <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, and um, I think those things, and then I, I also my on my maternal side, uh, my grandparents were refugees from Ukraine. Oh, okay. And um, I mean, my grandmother, despite everything she went through, which I couldn't believe, you know, believed in like Esperanto and <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And then I just, by personality, I'm kind of fierce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I've, in, in many ways I've been lucky, but I also know you have to make luck happen, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a twofold. Yeah. Yeah. Well... I really appreciate the opportunity to get to speak with you. It's been it's been a lot of fun, like hearing more of your background and what went into writing the book. And I I love just as as someone I'm I'm starting my career now. Like I'm still in graduate school, and so I love hearing stories like like yours. That it, I hope you know, even if one day I never do anything that gets me to lecture lecture internationally or something. Uh, it's just great joining a field 
where everyone's excited about that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So it's been you're a lot of fun. in graduate school you're in psychology yeah i'm i'm studying clinical psychology and i go on an uh, internship next year right so you're doing your phd then uh, actually, actually i'm getting my psyd so it's more like clinically yeah focused yeah 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 but i'm excited right um you know there's a guy who a, a colleague of mine hmm. You might be interested. I just thought of it because he's got his ID. Um, who's doing a lot of work in community psychoanalysis and Oh. Okay. also has written a lot about, well, so about, um, well, he's now just come out with another book on um, de uh, decolonizing psychoanalysis. Ah. Uh. And he wrote a book called... Um, Psychoanalysis for the People. Okay. Name is Daniel Gastambide, uh, Okay. G A Z T A M B I D E. And um, I can send you his, um, his, uh, you know, his link, his, uh, if you're interested. Yeah, that could be interesting. I mean, if you're interested in, because I'm not the only one, I mean, more and more people are doing this. Yeah. I, I was kind of the, if I may say so, the first one, but now a lot of people are doing this. And I mean, clinics are being set up in New York and, um, uh, you know, even Division 38 or 39, which you must know, you know, they just published a special issue on community psychoanalysis. Oh, And wow. so, so it's a happening thing. Uh huh. And um, Daniel might be, the reason I thought of it is he got a side D and, Okay. and he's much younger and Yeah, yeah, he might be cool. yeah. Yeah. So you, you're hopeful that uh, that community psychoanalysis will become just fr like from now. It'll it'll get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, in part because so much of the uh, Freud narrative has changed Uh huh. and people quote that 1918 passage that you just read is like that has be is becoming the quote you know and, um, and because so much is happening on the ground Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. i mean the harlem family institute is another um example of a community based clinic that's um psychoanalytically informed um now that's in new york i don't know where are you based Virginia Beach at the moment. okay so i don't know about virginia um but um but yeah i Yeah. mean and Yeah. also that the generations of quote orthodox psychoanalysts are really are pretty much dying out you know Uh, yeah, yeah. um but oh you know the lecture series everything around the country are hugely subscribed to the zoom meetings have like 150 200 people i mean it's re it's really thriving Yeah, yeah, exciting and stuff. the last not the current president but of the APA, the American Psychoanalytic, was a social worker. Oh, okay. B, a social worker. So, so the whole, you know, the ideology is shifting too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've really seen transformations over the last 20 years of, Hmm. of the association. Good, good. Good. Thanks. All right, Dr. Danta, thank you so much. My pleasure.